legend often grow out of very simple, very ordinary things. If a product, no matter how down to earth, can get itself seen as part of a popular myth, it can become irresistible, a classic. Levi Strauss and Company detected and exploited the glamour of a way of life. Millions of people who have no experience whatsoever of such a life see it as enviable, even noble. Jeans are part of the standard equipment of the world's youth. Ownership indicates that the wearer sees himself as part of a new, liberated, progressive, supposedly classless society. Levi's have powerful competitors, such as Lees and Wranglers, but they have spared no effort to persuade us that they were the first. Theirs is the authentic gene. Once you get past the, uh, the fact that they are durable and cheap, it has to do with what they suggest in terms of the romance of cowboy life and masculinity and allegiance to the working class and a certain kind of honesty. Uh, if there's such a thing as honesty in clothing, jeans seem to be the most honest clothes you can wear. Levi's happy combination, as far as company profits are concerned, of being symbolic of something, as well as highly functional, did not come about by chance. They are past masters of persuasion. Levi's advertising says to the world's youth that our genes are on your side. The real, the true Levi's gene is the 501. It's the object of a cult, and as such it demands ritual baptismal immersion. Yes, the, the very first <coughs> denim trousers I would have seen would have been in the sort of late 40s. I can't remember exactly when, but I, I went to art school in 1946 when I was 14, and either the next year or the year after, the teacher who taught a sculpture, went to America and came back with a pair of, of I suppose, um, I don't know whether they would have been Levi's, but of denim trousers. <clears throat> and you couldn't buy them here at all then, and I very much liked them, so I bought a, a boiler suit, um, you know, like workmen used to wear, which probably wasn't denim, but it was a blue material, and cut the top off and made it into a pair of, of denim trousers. So that, that was the very first pair, in, in, in I would think 1947 or 1948. I travelled for a year, I, I got a scholarship for a year and travelled right through um, France and Belgium, Italy, Spain and I thought I was kind of Jack Kerouac, you know, I, mean, I, I got this denim outfit and, and I bought some Spanish army boots with about four buckles on and I was on a scholarship so I wasn't really sort of on the road but it was, um, the scholarship was only £500 for a year so I was kind of thinking I was Jack Kerouac travelling around. So there was, certainly was an American influence by then. Most British teenagers had to wait until the early 1960s before they could burn their sports jackets and grey flannels. Ownership of 501s was limited to an envied few. As in Russia today, their scarcity added to their charm. The first Levi jeans which were sent on to me I started selling in the West End. It wasn't big business. And I had my own doubt because I was used to selling merchandise on the high quality market to Harrods, to Simpsons, and I simply couldn't believe that this item, which I called simply a, a denim trouser, 
would find the market all over the country. The gene market in those days, that was the Beatle time, you know, the, the time of the cannabis street business, and the time when young people were looking out for something new, that I found that Levi's is a gold mine. Levi's jeans are the most successful branded item of clothing ever designed. In the first hundred years of the firm's existence, they sold a hundred million pairs. Since then, they've probably doubled that, but now they keep their sales figures to themselves. They employ 37,000 workers in 111 locations from Penang to Northampton. Levi's Plaza is the new headquarters of what has become the largest clothing manufacturing company on earth. It's in downtown San Francisco, where it all began. In the late 19th century, San Francisco was booming. It was a major trading center, which supplied goods and services to the flourishing West Coast economy. It was a magnet to newcomers. Levi Strauss, a German Jewish immigrant, came to town in 1850. He set up shop making and selling dry goods. From modest premises in Battery Street, he dealt in pots and pans, shoes, tents, sails, clothes, he was on the lookout for other new lines. The man who invented the jeans, a man by the name of uh, Jacob Euphras, uh, uh, immigrant who changed his name in the United States to Jacob Davis, a tailor in Reno, Nevada, uh, who was asked to make a pair of pants and, uh, for one of his customers, who was a miner, and when the, they all complained the pants tore at the stress points. And he, uh, Davis, uh, also decided that what he would add to these things was something he made on the horse blankets that he made, which was rivets to hold the seams or the corners of the horse blankets. And he added rivets to the pants. They sold very well, uh, and he contacted Levi Strauss. As they say, the rest is history. In 1873, Strauss and Davis registered their idea for riveted trousers. Armed with a government patent, Levi's were able to take to law competitors whose patterns imitated too closely Mr. Davis's design and who were denting company profits. By the 1880s, 250 Levi's workers were turning out shrink-to-fit riveted jeans. The trousers they made were given a code, 501. Levi's jeans began to appeal not just to miners, but to working-class Americans who operated out of doors cowboys, mechanics, farmhands. They've never been especially cheap, but they were strong. And even then, a pair of 501s conferred a kind of status. And for about 50 years, Levi's sold to this solid, loyal constituency. They already had a, a working man's pant. What they were trying to do now was increase the identification of the pants with that market. Hence the rodeos and the advertisements of people sitting on, on corral fences and uh, uh, in that inimitable 1930s style. Levi's cashed in on urban America's obsession with its frontier past. Conveniently, Hollywood Westerns seemed to underwrite the company's implicit claim that their jeans were the ones to wear when a man had to do what a man had to do. This place ain't big enough for you and me. So you better get rolling. And suppose I don't get rolling, you will. Suppose I got you figured right. You're yellow. In such movies, the good guys, like Tex Ritter, usually wore the cleanest, most turned up at the bottom jeans. If Levi seemed to go with moral superiority and physical prowess, it was a point not lost on well-heeled Easterners. And, despite their apparently macho image, jeans began to be worn by women. And it wasn't just the mystic and symbolic properties of the trouser that sold it. 
you can take a pair of jeans and wear it every day for a month and not have to wash it or clean it, and it's still acceptable socially as a form of apparel. You take any other pair of pants and uh, do the same thing, and you just look like a bum. So for one reason or another, the nature of the material and how it looks after you've worn it for a while, whether it's a month or five years, makes it, in terms of uh, its uh, financial implication, a very different uh, issue than most other choices that you have. So I think part of it really is functional. The material came originally from Nîmes in France, literally de Nîmes. Levi's have stuck to their formidably stiff and unyielding denim and to their ferociously strong stitching, a throwback to the old sail-making days. But, of course, the whole point is that as soon as possible, the jeans should be made to look threadbare, as if worn out by a hard life on ranch and range. Even if, more probably, they were seen less often at the rodeo than the studio. Well, these are 501s, but when I bought them, I didn't know that. I mean, um, when I bought them, what I was interested in was the fact that they had buttons rather than a zip, and, and they had... Um, this was the first kind of wave of imports from, from you know, which later became shops like Flip, you know, but this was a little shop in the King's Road, and I bought the jacket, and I bought two pairs of 501s, and one to mend the other, and by mistake, the good pair got, got um, sort of cannibalised, so that, that bit was cut off to mend something else, when the, this pair were actually perfectly good at that point, and then that, that wore, you know, so that was mended later on. This is one of the oldest pair of Levi's 501 blue jeans that we have here at Levi Strauss and Company. They were found in a gold rush mine a number of years ago by some hikers in the foothills of California. The elements in the front of a pair of Levi's, the rivets, the button fly, were established in 1873. The famous stitching at the back called, in the jargon of the trade, an arcuate, goes back to 1873 as well. The company claims that it's the oldest clothing trademark in the world. Back in 1873, there was also a cinch back, a small buckle that let the wearer adjust the width of the waist a bit. They added the two horse patch in 1886. It graphically represented the company's guarantee to replace any jeans that tore. Around 1900, a second pocket was added in response, it was thought, to public demand. As the century progressed, the company became more and more sophisticated about anticipating what the public wanted from their jeans. Research detected a certain amount of anxiety among Americans as to whether their jeans would stay up, and in 1922, reassuring belt loops were added. By the mid-1930s, a wave of imitators was eating into what Levi's regarded as their market, in an attempt to reinforce the brand's unique identity, a new trademark, the famed Red Tab, was added. And ever since then, it has featured at the heart of all Levi's advertising and promotion. A year later, following complaints about how the jeans sometimes tore up holstery, the back rivets disappeared. During the Second World War, the manufacture of jeans was subject to US government control. As an austerity measure, they wanted the design simplified. Out went the cinch back, the belt loops, the brace buttons. Only the belt loops were ever restored in 1945. By then, the Levi's 501 had achieved, or so the company believed, perfection. It had evolved into its final form. It was ready to take on the world. mounted a fresh assault on the markets east of the Mississippi. But it wasn't that that caused the big breakthrough. Films like The Wild One in 1953, with a Levi's-clad Marlon Brando, projected an image of glamorous juvenile delinquency. It was to appeal not only to Hell's Angels, but to middle-class teenagers from prosperous suburbs. More potent yet was James Dean. He was the romantic outsider, 
inarticulate yet strong, tortured yet intriguing, and he wore 501s in all his films. We probably have a great many young people watching our show tonight, and for their benefit, I'd like your opinion about fast driving on the highway. Do you think it's a good idea? A good point. I, uh, I used to fly around quite a bit, you know. I took a lot of unnecessary chances on the highways. Middle America, in the shape of Gig Young, attempted to channel James Dean's subversive power over its youth into wholesome ends. So cautious. Speaking of racing, have you ever been in a drag race? Are you kidding me? I just thought I'd ask. No, Jim races in the tradition, you might say. Real racing cars, real tracks. How fast will your car go? Oh, an honest miles an hour. Clock, it run about 106, 7. Well, uh, gig. I think I'd better take off. Oh, wait a minute, Jimmy. Um, one more question. Do you have any special advice for the young people who drive? Take it easy driving. The uh, life you might say it might be mine. <laughs> A few months after making this commercial, the first teenage hero died in a car crash. His legend was thus assured. Hollywood and peer pressure dealt the Levi's marketing people some high cards. They were able to play upon the anxiety and aspirations of the fastest growing economic force in America, its youth. In the 60s, student radicals took on their government on issues such as civil rights in Vietnam. So did a good many European students, and on both continents, the heroic associations jeans had made them, and 501s in particular, the trousers to get busted in. It became almost a uniform of, of uh, rebellion, if you will, against the uh, establishment and the rules of the establishment. Uh, so in the 60s, you saw the, the popularity of jeans grow so dramatically, again, because it almost became a uniform of, of uh, a statement that, that people could make very comfortably. By the 70s, the uniform of revolution had become just another style. The Dust Bowl look conquered weekend. This jacket I bought when I bought these two pairs of jeans. Uh, I would have thought, I'm, I, I'm guessing it was sort of 68, um, in 1968. It, it's, um, it's the thing that makes it so interesting, apparently, I mean, I didn't know any of this, but, but I, I gave it to my daughter, who now wears it, and, and she was wearing it, and we went into American Classics in the King's Road, and, and they were very excited and said something like they'd only had, ever had three of them. And it's something to do with this vertical pleating, and it's a very particular kind, um, which, again, I was completely innocent of when I got it. You know, so I can't claim um, that it was to do with style. But this... I also have to say I didn't ever, in, in, in all the time, wear complete denim. <laughs> you know, so this is... Um, this is for you and all you. So that's, um, that's that jacket. I could just about do it up, I think, to do, yeah. It is a very, it is a very sort of big one. That's a 501. Yes, I'm pretty sure this is a 501. It's the same, same buttons. And, and, and I think it's that detailing that makes it 
the five of them. He's authentically scarred and torn, isn't it? Yes, I don't know what... <coughs> it looks as though he, he, whoever wore it might have been attacked with a... You know, I mean, even, even with a tomahawk or something. And then this, this is a rather... Oddly enough, this looks the quaintest, you know, because this, this is one I, I bought new in the 70s and wore throughout the 70s. And this, in a way, is the most dated, I think, this kind of... That rather, rather hippie one. I don't know. Still a nice... I, I don't think I could go out in that at the moment. <laughs> Now this, this one is just a straight. The competition grew stiffer. The old 501 faced a sea of rival jeans. Stretch jeans, flared jeans, designer jeans. Not least, there were the stonewashed and artificially weathered jeans, where the patina of age that 501 purchasers had had to earn through cold baths and hard wear could be bought. We want dark color. Levi's competitors hit the market with all the outward and visible signs of jean integrity. Leather patches, archaic stitching, venerable looking trademarks. Sure, the market had been saturated since, since the early 70s, since jeans were uh, on everybody's bottom. Uh, the, the market has actually come down some. The company coped in various ways and one of them was to expand and to make various other products. And we attempted to answer many of uh, the market happenings by expanding ourselves, by in fact trying to extend the reach of our brand beyond jeans and into other products. The diversification paid off, but the image of Levi's as jean makers was too strong for the public ever really to buy the idea that they could make two-piece suits as well. More fundamentally, the company was in danger of dissipating its most precious possession, its strong identity in the public mind. Not before time, Levi's looked to their roots. Symbolically, in 1982, they moved from a skyscraper to their purpose-built low-rise complex. They were back on Battery Street, where Mr. Strauss had once run his store. The move marked a return to basics in policy too, the company decided that their main job was, after all, making jeans. In the past few years, as we looked at our marketing strategies, we decided to go back to the 501, that this was, uh, this was needed both internally and externally to reestablish our quality, uh, our, our heritage, and that's basically what we decided to do. Levi's most famous campaign aimed to persuade a new generation that 501s were still glamorous. Cool, narcissistic, insolent, the Levi's hero projected a new image of the supposedly new man making out in the post-sexual revolution 80s. But still, he's the romantic outsider. Still, in fact, very like James Dean. And it paid off. 501 sales rose 800%. When the new 501s um, came out, I did buy a pair, but um, I think the largest they make are 38 waist, and I don't think I'm ever going to be down to a 38 waist again. So, so I've got them, but I'll probably never be able to wear them. that all of marketing in contemporary life is about trying to find that, that magic combination of elements that where something will go beyond this function and become symbolically so powerful that uh, it becomes irresistible. But certainly I think marketing men all over the world spend all their time thinking of that possibility, it's sort of the holy grail, you know, finding that combination of function and symbol that makes an object go beyond its purpose.